So uh, hello and welcome uh, to TCAF 2021, everybody. Uh, my name is Miles Baker and I'm the executive director of the Toronto Comic Arts Festival. Uh, and this is Comics Carousel, a feature program of TCAF, Comic, uh, TCAF 2021. Uh, special thanks to our programming sponsor, Seneca College School of Creative Arts and Animation. Uh, they were a, a very generous sponsor this year for all of our programming. So uh, thanks so much to them. Uh, before I hand things off to Robert, I would like to take a moment to honor the original caretakers of the land that I am on. The Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, Mississauga, Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, and the Wendat peoples. I'm joining you today from my home, which is in territory that was the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, Haudenosaunee, and allied nations. This area is also covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. This acknowledgement is part of a long process in learning what it means to live, work, and make art on colonized land. Going forward, TCAF is committed to increasing Indigenous voices and perspectives in our program. And uh, for today's program, uh, it's Comics Carousel, which is a program uh, that we've run at past TCAFs, including 2018 and 2016. So it's really fantastic to have a piece of normal TCAF uh, in this year's show. Um, and it's going to be one of our best carousels ever, I think. So I urge you to grab a carbonated or fermented beverage of your choice and strap in for some talented creators sharing incredible works. Our host for tonight is uh, Mr. Sikoriak, uh, our Sikoriak, more, more commonly known. Uh, he is an educator, illustrator, and cartoonist. He is the author of Masterpiece Comics, The Unquotable Trump, and Constitution Illustrated. His work has uh, appeared in many publications, including The New Yorker, The Onion, and Mad Magazine. Uh, and this comics carousel has toured numerous comic shows all over Canada, United States, so we know what we're doing here. Uh, Robert, over to you. Thank you, Miles. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, very excited to be at TCAF, at least virtually this year. Um, we have a big show for you tonight. Uh, I'm gonna uh, just, quickly mention our guests and then I will introduce them more formally later. We have Decor, um, Abby Denson, and John Jennings. Please give them a hand in your tiny rooms. Um, and uh, yeah, so I've been doing the show for many years. Um, the way it usually works is uh, artists will present their work sometimes in a more performative way. I think we're all going to be doing readings tonight. Uh, with images, and then afterwards we'll have some time for a Q&A. So please uh, add your questions to the chat or whichever the right place is to put it. Um, I'll leave that to the technical people to tell you. Um, so uh, let's begin the show, shall we? Come with me into the world of comics. Uh, I'm going to open up this screen here, and we'll get going. So my uh, latest book is called Constitution Illustrated, and this is what it looks like. And um, it's in it's a uh, it's an entirely illustrated version of the complete United States Constitution, covering 120 years of American comics. Each page is in a different style, and I'm not going to show you all of it. I'm just going to read a few excerpts from the amendments. So let me see how this goes. <laughs> Some of the additional amendments. Amendment 13. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. Amendment 14. Section 1. All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. Section two, representatives shall be apportioned among the several states according to their respective numbers, counting the whole number of persons in each state, excluding Indians not taxed. Section three, no person shall be a senator or representative in Congress 
or elector of president and vice president, or hold any office, civil or military, who, having previously taken an oath to support the Constitution of the United States, shall have engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the same, or given aid or comfort to the enemies thereof. Section 4. The validity of the public debt of the United States, including debts incurred for payment or pensions for services in suppressing insurrection or rebellion, shall not be questioned. Amendment 15. The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Amendment 17. The Senate of the United States shall be composed of two senators from each state, elected by the people thereof for six years. When vacancies happen in the representation of any state in the Senate, the executive authority of such state shall issue writs of election to fill such vacancies. Amendment 19. The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States on account of sex. Amendment 24. The right of citizens of the United States to vote in any primary or other election for president or vice president shall not be denied or abridged by the United States by reason of failure to pay any poll tax or other tax. And finally, for today, Amendment 26. The right of citizens of the United States who are 18 years of age or older to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of age. Thank you. There we go. Thank you so much. There's lots more where that came from, but I'll spare you for today. Um, so now we get to our guests who are why you are here. Um, our first guest was born in Rosario, Argentina in 1981. He is a self-taught cartoonist and illustrator and the author of several books. His bio is very long, but in the interest of speed, I'm going to move on and say his latest book is When You Look Up, Please Welcome Decor. Muchas gracias, Robert. Gracias por la invitación de corazón, de todo corazón. Estoy muy, muy contento y esperé este momento todo el día, te podrás imaginar. Así que voy a presentar. Esta es mi novela, mi primer novela gráfica, Cuando levantas la mirada. Y voy a darle el turno a Karina para que lo traduzca. Um, so, thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, uh, he says he's very excited to be here. He's been waiting all day. And uh, That Boggy Held Up is his latest graphic novel, When You Look Up. Bueno, es una novela que me llevó tres años y que me dio mucho, mucha emoción haberla visto convertirse en, en papel y poder olerla. Y ahora les voy a mostrar cómo, cómo inician sus primeras páginas. Um, so, it took three years to put this together and it was really exciting to see it become a real book that you can smell and hold in your hands. And now he's going to show you uh, some of the first pages of the, of the novel so you can see how it begins. And as I am here to translate, I will read these for everyone. So, when you look up, um, by the core. They had arrived. Mom, now all my friends will only exist inside my cell phone. Your friends live in your heart, Lorenzo, which has a lot more storage space than a phone. Lorenzo's mother put her favorite plants in the car so they wouldn't get hurt in the moving truck. Lorenzo took his phone charger, action figures, and colored pencils. No signal. Lorenzo, how about taking a break from your phone? It's beautiful outside. When I was your age, I'd stick my hand out of the window and pretend to fly. Uh, okay. They arrived at their new house. I really hope you like it here, Lorenzo. Mom, do we have Wi-Fi? When you go upstairs, 
The door on the right leads to your new room. I'll stay down here and make us some sandwiches. Oh, such a strange piece of furniture. Could it be a piano? No, pianos don't have drawers. And this key. Every drawer Lorenzo opened smelled like something he'd never smelled before. Somewhere between old wood and something he didn't know how to describe. Nothing. Lorenzo felt frustrated, but he kept looking. His heart beat faster at the thought of all the toys that he might find behind the door. But all he found was a notebook. Bien. Y... Ahí comienza ya el, el desenlace de la, de la novela, ¿no? El, Lorenzo empieza a dejar un poco de lado su, su celular y, y empieza a mirar un poco la realidad que lo, que lo envuelve, que lo rodea. So that's sort of how it begins, and uh, Lorenzo sort of um, is a bit more separated from his digital life and his phone. He starts to rediscover through this notebook the world that's actually around him. Lo interesante también de él es que nunca deja de lado el celular, de su teléfono, sino que lo implementa en su vida, buscando en el GPS o la ubicación de una ciudad, sacando fotos o alumbrando con la linterna, encuentra una especie de equilibrio entre la tecnología y la realidad física, las cosas palpables. Um, and that's not to say that he totally leaves uh, digital stuff behind or his phone behind. He uses it uh, to better uh, be part of the world, to look up places, to take photos. Uh, and so he finds a sort of balance between this digital stuff he's used to and the actual world around them. Y ahora quería mostrarles cómo, cómo nació esta novela, los primeros bocetos, las primeras cositas que se me vinieron a la cabeza. Y después uh, se fue armando todo, ¿no? Uh, and so he's going to show us uh, some of the first sketches of when the, the idea was just coming to life. Um, and how it all sort of developed. Uh, and sort of, yeah. Acá hay algo muy, muy, muy significativo porque era el teléfono vibrando y, y sonando constantemente y el libro durmiendo ya, durmiendo la siesta. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this one felt quite significant because the phone is making noise and it's moving uh, and the book is totally still as if it's like asleep. Y bueno, comenzaron a aparecer las primeras imágenes en mi cabeza de alguna forma de, de tratar de, de desenrollar toda esta madeja grande de hilo que tenía para poder empezar a desenvolverla y empezar a contar la, la historia, cosa que no es fácil cuando una novela tiene casi 200 páginas, ¿no? Right, and so these are some of the first sketches just to try and make sense of, uh, you know, the sort of convoluted um, yarn of sort of ideas that he had in his mind, so. Bueno, acá, por ejemplo, en esta parte en especial, Lorenzo trata de hacerle zoom al libro, al cuaderno que él tenía en la mano, intenta agrandar ese conejito que se ve y no, ve que no puede. Esa cosa de, de estar todo el tiempo con la tecnología que a veces nos sucede a nosotros, de querer agrandar algo en un libro. Right, so this detail is just a, a reflex because we're used to zooming with our fingers on screens and uh, Lorenzo's trying it on a piece of paper uh, sort of without thinking and it's sort of not not working the same. Y después toda hay, la novela interior tiene cuatro cuentos que están narrados de esta manera que están viendo, que son recortes de papeles muy muy pequeños sobre una misma hoja de, de ese color, que tiene relación con el mundo que rodea a Lorenzo y el cuaderno. And there's sort of four stories within the story that are made in this way with very small paper cutouts um, as well. Pueden ver, por ejemplo, el, blo el brócoli que aparece en esa, en esa cuadra es el mismo que aparece en, la, en, el, en el cuaderno de Lorenzo, el cuaderno que encontró Lorenzo. Right, and so some visual elements actually carry over like this tree we see on the left from the real world into the imagined world inside of no Lorenzo's notebook. Y la, la inspiración en la vida real con mi perro paseando por la plaza, ¿no? ¿De dónde tomo el punto de fuga? 
and that's just an inspirational sort of comparison to his actual life with his actual dog in like his actual sort of you know, environment. Soy de Argentina, de un pueblo muy pequeño, y bueno, ahí lo están viendo. <laughs> and uh, this is sort of the, the small town in Argentina that the coot is from and where he lives. So here it is. Así que eso es todo. Y muchísimas, muchísimas gracias por la invitación. Gracias Enchanted Lion también. Eh, y agradecidos con todo. Así que estoy ansioso por seguir escuchándolos a ustedes ahora. Uh, and yeah, that's it. So thank you so much. And uh, yeah, he's very excited to listen to everyone else and stuff. Um, and do we do a Q&A right now or at the end? We'll do that at the end. So yeah, we'll Great. do a Q we'll do a Q&A with everyone at the very end of the show. So put your questions in the chat or the Q&A and we'll follow them up later. Uh, I forgot to introduce you, Lorena. Thank you for translating. Oh, <laughs> and decor, that was lovely. Gracias. So thank you so much. Um, our, our next guest is the author of many books, such as Cool Tokyo Guide, Cool Japan Guide, Daltopia, and Tough Love, High School Confidential. Her latest book is Kitty Sweet Tooth, illustrated by Utumaru. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Please welcome Abby Denson. Hi, everybody. Hi, see. Abby. Let me get my screen share on. All right. While you're doing that, I'll just mention, you did say you had some behind the scenes work. Feel free to show that now as well. Yeah, I do. I have, um, here we go. Great, thanks. Here's Abby, everybody. Looking good? Looks great, thank you. Okay, thank you. Hi, so I'm Abby Denson. I'm the author, like you said, I'm the author of Cool Tokyo Guide, Cool Japan Guide. Uh, various others, Daltopia, but right now I am happy to present my new book illustrated by Udomaru Kitty Sweet Tooth. I'm going to do a short reading and I'll show a little behind the scenes. Kitty Sweet Tooth. Kitty Sweet Tooth is a cat who loves traveling, sweets, and movies. She also loves visiting her dentist, Dr. Shine, for regular cleanings. Her teeth look great as usual, Kitty. Thanks, it's because I brush and floss twice a day, just like you told me to. It's a beautiful day. I think I'll visit Pop Pop next. Ooh, looks like he's got some new candy in today. Hi, my angel. How was your visit with Dr. Shine? It was great. Perfect checkup. This calls for a special treat. Want to try the new candy that just arrived? Ooh, yes, thanks. This is the latest thing, flavor changing cotton candy from Stormy Mountain. Ooh, I heard a mad scientist make some wild creations up there. Wow, this is amazing. First it tastes like lemon, then watermelon, then cherry. You should serve this candy in your movie theater. It's fun to watch movies while eating special snacks. Good idea. Hey, let's take a walk over to the Wonder Palace now. It sure is an impressive theater. I've been running this theater for a very long time, but it's getting old and people like watching movies at home now. I'm also getting very busy with the sweet shop, so I may have to sell the theater soon. Oh no, pop up, please don't sell the theater. I'll help any way I can. The Wonder Palace will be successful again. You'll see. Why, thank you, Kitty. I'll certainly listen to your ideas. I know, you can combine my two favorite things, sweets and movies. The theater could reopen as a gourmet movie house where screenings are accompanied by special food and drinks. Wow, Kitty, what a great idea. I will try your idea out for a month on one condition. What condition? You'll be my new theater manager. I'll do it. I can choose the movies and develop the special menus. Kitty, you remember Danny. He is the projectionist and caretaker for the theater. I couldn't help but overhear that you're the new manager. Just let me know if you need anything, boss. 
Those are our ushers, Dee Dee, Cece, and BB. They're sugar gliders, so they can glide down from high places, which is especially handy for dusting the curtains. Hello, hello, hello. Yippee, whee, look out below. Wow. If you need some help making the special snacks, you should talk to my niece. Your niece? She is Dr. Bettina Redwing, a respected local scientist. Do you mean the notorious mad scientist who lives on Stormy Mountain? Oh, she's not mad. Just very, 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 very smart and misunderstood. Even though she's a little scared, Kitty Sweet Tooth decides to visit Dr. Bettina's laboratory on Stormy Mountain. A mad scientist, uh, I mean, a misunderstood scientist. Gee, I hope she's friendly. Knock, knock. Crack, come in. Welcome to my lab. Wow. Hi, Dr. Redwing, I'm Kitty Sweet Tooth. I hope I'm not disturbing you. Not at all. My uncle Danny said I should expect you. And call me Dr. Bettina, all of my friends do. Will do. Come and meet my good friend and collaborator, Walter Witch. A witch? That's right, he's a good witch. Also, he is extremely fabulous and totally talented. Walter, this is our new friend, Kitty. She's the theater manager I told you about. Enchanted, ready to make some magic? Let me show you around. This place is amazing. This is where I mix potions and practice spells. Oh, wow. This is where I work on scientific experiments. Fantastic. It's going to take a lot of hard work to clean and renovate the theater. Together, we can do it. After all their hard work and cooperation, the theater looks amazing. I can't wait to use our new magic food lab. We'll come up with so many snack innovations here. Wow, Kitty, it looks fantastic. With my ideas and Dr. Bettina's and Walter's talent, this will be the best theater ever. The first week, Attack of the Mega Glob. Tonight's menu, mega expanding jelly dessert. Presenting our first great food invention for the Tasterama, mega expanding jelly dessert. The magic is in the presentation. You just squeeze one drop onto the plate and pop. Exposure to oxygen causes the jelly to expand. It tastes great too. Welcome to the Tasterama grand opening. Take your seats. Snacks will be served before the screening. Kitty, the place looks great. Thanks, Dr. Shine. I hope you enjoy the show. Here you go. Oh, wow. It expanded. Pop. It tastes kind of like fresh watermelon or grapes. Everybody is enjoying the movie. This is the best part when the mega glob attacks. Fascinating. Whoopsie. Danger. Do not expose to oxygen. Whoa. Sometimes life really does imitate art. Help. My mega expanding jelly dessert formula worked even better than I expected. We have to do something. Oh my, what fun. Is this part of the show? Reminds me of my swamp years. I know. To stop it, we just need to eat it. So I'm going to quickly bring you to a video of Udo Maro doing the art just because I'm getting a little short on time. I don't want to miss this. So this is a video of Udo Maru um, drawing Kitty Sweet Tooth. And this is her method. She uses a Cinti. This was about a 10 minute video and uh, we sped it up to about one minute. And I, as someone who draws a uh, pen and paper, I'm always incredibly blown away by seeing <laughs> people and their sense of technique. But uh, it's, we are friends and we were friends before we did this book. And it luckily just kind of came together when I was trying to pitch this book. Uh, she was my first choice to try to get it going. And this is her first US book. So this is like her American debut. And it's actually her first comic book. She never drew a comic before. She was an illustrator, she's an illustrator and a um, anime character designer. So it was like a really exciting process to go through her and go through it and share my knowledge of making comics. I've been drawing my own comics for almost 20 years, probably more than 20 years now. 
So it was really cool to kind of go through that and work with somebody as incredibly talented as her to show her the comic world. So I think that's it for, that's my time. So I'm going to unshare, there we go. Thanks, Thank Abby. <laughs> that was great. I'm glad, I'm glad you roped uh, Udumaro into comics. Sounds like yeah. first time. That was, that was lovely. So if she's watching, hello. <laughs> Thank you. Um, that's great. Um, our, our next and final guest is uh, another long bio. I'm going to do my best. If I forget anything important, let me know. He okay. is a professor of media and cultural studies at the University of California at Riverside. He is the founder and curator of the Abrams Megascope line of graphic novels, and his latest of many books is After the Rain. Please welcome John Jennings. Hey, how y'all doing? <laughs> Thanks for having me. Um, I love TCAF so much. All right, so I'm going to do the reading first, and then have I have a few um, behind, you know, just kind of like pro, what do you call it, behind the scenes images or whatever. Perfect. Um, all right, so I'm reading from Comicsology. Let me see here. So I'm going to share my screen. Can everyone see that? Yeah, looks good. Okay, all right. So after the rain. Whoosh. Clip, clip, clip. Crack. A tiger does not proclaim his tigritude, it pounces. Will Soyinka, Sub-Saharan Africa's first Nobel laureate. Squish. Crush. Squish. Crush. Whoosh. Oh my God. Get yourself together, Chiyama. Oh, shit. Where is he? <gasps> Me? Jesus. <laughs> you too. In all of my five years as a cop on the South Side of Chicago, I had never seen anything like this, never. The boy laughed and spoke to me in Igbo, water dripping from his lips. You need help, me and you. How, me, you too, how are you alive? As I witnessed this impossible boy, my mind went back to another boy I'd encountered in my other home of Chicago. As a police detective, I'd seen plenty of dead, mutilated, and bleeding bodies. A year ago, I'd had a boy's lifeblood run over my hands and he stared sadly into my eyes. He'd been stabbed five times. His blood had been so warm and it remained under my nails for days. And that wasn't even my worst encounter with death. So I wasn't easily shaken. Before I could reach for him, you too. He reached for me. You're it. Lightning fast, he tapped my right hand. Just before it happened, I had a flashback of when I used to play tag in grade school. Ah, he, 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 I love playing tag. He, he, you're it, he, he. Shit, it burns. I yelped, then it was as my very being was repulsed. I flew back about five feet before landing hard on my ass and the air knocked from my chest, my teeth rattling. Sharp pain shut all the way from my fingertips to toenails. Ogini? Were you outside? I shook my head trying to get up, but you opened the door. Who was at the door? Stupid, stupid girl. Three days before it had started raining cats and dogs out of nowhere, thunder rolled in the skies, lightning crashed. The wind shook the trees and turned the red dirt to red mud. Three days of steady rain, it had stopped only minutes before the boy showed up at the door. This kind of weather never happened as part of Nigeria during this time of year. But who was I to question the things of nature? Who was I? 
I left myself thinking, of course, it just had to happen right now. I was only going to be in a village visiting my grandmother and grand aunt for two weeks. And now the entire first week was going to be a guaranteed mud and mosquito fest. Little did I know that this was the least of my worries. Come on. Squishing through the mud, we looked all over the yard for that creepy boy. Grandma even looked in the kitchen, excuse me, in the, in the chicken coop and behind a noisy generator. We didn't find a trace of him. Even his footprints had disappeared in the mud. Above the sky churned with exciting rain clouds, excuse me, exiting rain clouds, rain clouds. Already I could see peaks of sunlight, but I was too bothered to be happy about it. Why were you stupid enough to open the door the second time? Grandma, he should, he should have been dead. I saw brain. Who would do that to a child? And where the heck would he go? This is so weird. If you see a monster at your doorstep, the wise thing to do is shut the door. <sighs> you Americanized Nigerians, no instinct. He was hurt. You can't just, you knew better. Deep down, you knew not to open that door. Okay, she was right. I don't know why I opened the door again. It was like my hand had a mind of its own. Or maybe it was some sort of grim fascination. You feel all right? We'll have to keep an eye on you. Thank you for that. I will stop sharing that. And um, I want to show a couple of things from this kind of process thing, so I could if I have enough time. Absolutely, so, go for it. OK, so basically, this is the first book. Um, it's an adaptation that I did uh, with David Brame, who actually used to teach at Ryerson in Toronto. Uh, and now is uh, in Canada, excuse me, Alaska. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's the first of the four uh, books that we just released from Megascope. Abrams Megascope is a, um, a line of books dedicated to looking at uh, speculative fiction by and about people of color. So that includes science fiction, fantasy, horror, magical realism, and the like. We're also doing like some crime fiction and also some historical fiction. And I'm the curator of, of the line of books is so extremely honored to, to do so. So the, the, um, the original book, excuse me, the original uh, piece that I adapted this from is from uh, my friend Nedia Korofor's book, Kabu Kabu. And it was a, um, a short story, our only horror story that she's written actually uh, called On the Road. And I was just fascinated by it. And I asked her, could I adapt it years ago, actually, maybe like eight years ago. And uh, got busy working on the Octavia Butler stuff, got married, you know, ended up moving across camp, uh, across the country. <laughs> so um, I, had done, I had done the breakdowns for, the, for the, the adaptation, but I just didn't have time to work on it. And so I asked my friend David Brain if he would draw the book for us and I would do the, and I'd do the finishes. I actually did the colors on the book and I did the, the adaptation of it. And uh, we just thought it would be a, a perfect uh, first book for the line. So this is just some like test things that we did. Like we've actually worked on collaborative projects. The, um, these are like just test images to kind of figure out how to work together. David did the black and white work and I did the color work. And just kind of figuring out like, okay, well, this is how the, uh, how we would work together, you know. So here's some of the breakdowns from the pages. Uh, both of us work digitally now. Uh, this is my studio. Well, we know what I can't, you know, I'm sharing. <laughs> my studio essentially is an iPad. <laughs> All right, so I, I use Procreate. Uh, I was gonna show it, but I actually, oh, I'm sharing my screen, so I can't. Um, yeah, but so my, I basically work in Procreate on, on, the, on the iPad Pro. And it's been um, really interesting. Like the, the, the parable of the solar book, for instance, that we did was totally done on the iPad. And um, yeah, here's some, you can see like some of the breakdowns he was doing here. And he works in um, Clip Studio, I think, or no, that's not right. I don't think it's not Clip Studio. Another drawing program. And so we just, we, we work together and just select a trim size for the book. And um, he does all the, the, he did all the inks. And like I said, I did all the colors. Here's some of the inking process here. Here's some of the color flats. So you can see what the colors look like before I do my renders and things on the, uh, on the final. And uh, yeah, so that's it. And uh, thank you so much for letting me uh, read from After the Rain. Thank you, that was great. Thank you. Uh, let's uh, applaud for all of our guests. Um, but the show's not over. Uh, we still have about, I'm gonna say 15 or 20 minutes for questions. I see a bunch in the Q&A, if there's any more. I haven't looked in the chat yet, but if there's other things in the chat, I'll check there too. 
Um, let's see, I'll, I'll go backwards from the, from the uh, questions. Um, first one is for John. Uh, you. Can you tell us more about using color to create mood and tone in the text or how you approach your color choices? I think it, it depends on what the project is. Um, I think of colors, if, if, you, if you take like the, the idea of the medium of comics and kind of like map it onto filmmaking, I look at color as kind of like the soundtrack to a certain degree. Of, of, you know, so it's, it's, it's like a really, really wonderful uh, way to get across mood, to get across movement, uh, to get across emotion and affect. Uh, this is a horror story. So basically a lot of it is about the affect that you're trying to get across. Uh, and so I try to use colors that we don't necessarily see a lot of, you know, like the magentas and the, and the fuchsia colors and stuff. I mean, you see them, but it's like, you know, not in the, the natural world. So I was trying to use them as a way to kind of talk about the differences between like the spiritual world and the, and the real world. If you read the book, there's a lot of tension about the reality you know, that, that she's experiencing, that Chioma's experiencing, and then the encroachment of like a spiritual plane. And I wanted to kind of get across those two different things by using kind of like, not necessarily a natural tone, but just kind of a more surreal tone from the edges. And that's kind of like how I was thinking about mm -hmm. coloring. I mean, but a lot of times it's definitely like, um, I'm using symbolism and, and color symbolism uh, to, to think about how we do the storytelling with the, with the color choices. Great. Well, actually, you you all use color so strikingly. Um, I don't know, Decor, if, if you want to jump in about your color use and how you develop the sort of fanci fanciful worlds through color. Um, Señor Decor, ¿le gustaría comentar sobre su uso de color en su, en su trabajo? Bueno, sí, por supuesto. Eh, trato de, de contar una, un, un sentimiento y una emoción a través del color, cosa que no es tan sencillo. Pero en su gran mayoría, eh, como suelo dibujar cosas del, del, del pasado y de mi infancia, eh, suelo recurrir casi siempre a los colores sepia, a los colores eh, amarillos, eh, marrones. Um, great. So, um, actually, because a lot of it is, uh, a lot of his subject matter is about his own childhood and his past and things like that, uh, there's a lot of sepia tones throughout. Uh, a lot of the work uh, and overall the color is used um, very emotionally just to create a mood uh, uh, as opposed to a symbol in this case. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Abby, I know you're collaborating here, but you also work in color and, you, and I'm curious if you had a lot of back and forth in, in terms of uh, making the visuals. Yeah, yeah, actually, I can share my screen again and show you a couple slides of what we did in the process, if that's mm -hmm. okay. Yes, please. Uh, yeah, so Kitty Sweet Tooth is a character in a story I would had in mind for a long time. Um, okay. All right. Does it look good? Yes. The slides where I want them. Okay. So let's go to this slide. All right. So that's me and Udo Mario in Tokyo. So um, we've been friends for several years, and I knew her as an illustrator. We randomly met in a Suspiria movie themed bar in Tokyo. <laughs> uh, so we're both fans of movies and horror movies and B movies. But, uh, you know, She's an incredible illustrator and she's an anime character designer as well. So when I wanted to make Kitty Sweet Tooth, uh, and this is my version of the character on the left and that's her version on the right. We did this sketch <laughs> together when we were together in 2017. Um, but Kitty Sweet Tooth is a character that is a long time character that I've drawn as like an auto bio almost um, character about my travels or uh, a lot of times I do food comics and things with her. And she appears in my Japan guides as well in my version. So um, in 2014, I what's great, always date your sketchbooks because I found this old sketch. This is from 2014 and this is my version of what Kitty Sweet Tooth's Taste Ram on movie theater was gonna be like. And a lot of this ended up in the end. But as you can see, obviously, she has a completely different style than me and she's a lot more detailed and it's a totally different type of style. But this is where the idea came from. And I also did this little strip back in the day 
that introduces the characters and the concept of the story. And I never really published it as a mini comic or anything, but I was thinking maybe I would. But then I decided I wanted to collaborate with an artist and bring it to first second. Um, and I wanted, and she was the top of my mind, like an ideal artist, I think for the feeling of Kitty Sweet Tooth and the vibe of it, but she never really drew a graphic novel before. And she was mostly doing illustrations and character design. So uh, when I developed the pitch on the left side, those are my versions. And you can see the colors that she uses on the right are basically very similar to the color or the same as the colors I designed here. So it was really cool to be able to collaborate with someone. And I feel like when I saw her art, like it completely blew my mind and made me so happy. And I, and I think that can be rare when you're, when you are your own artist and you collaborate with another artist, it could go very wrong <laughs> if, and you could be very upset <laughs> if, if it doesn't work out, but we ended up being perfect partners. I, she ended up being so incredible. Uh, you know, she, I knew she was an incredible artist, but she's also faster than I expected, incredible to pick up everything and very agreeable to whatever my suggestions are, but she also pushed it that extra level, which I think when you are collaborating with another artist, you really want someone who can take it somewhere you couldn't take it yourself and bring something to it that you couldn't do yourself. And uh, so that's, been amazing that we got to do that. So uh, this is another example of just on the left side was some promotional art and I, I just kind of really did this fast sketch on the left side. So that's my art and it ended up being very close to what our final cover ended up being. And you can see the same elements that I drew on the left side are mostly there on the right side, but it's this whole other world, you know, and um, I think I in the she hadn't really drawn comics too much before. And also because, you know, the, in the US reading order of panels is different than the Japan manga reading order. I provided these for the whole book for her. So I, I didn't give her a whole lot of like, the art must look this exact way, but I did provide these layouts or thumbnails and I numbered the panels. And it just was to me amazing how quickly she picked it all up and ended up not even, you know, that was one of my concerns when we went into it, that it might be a problem or might take longer because of that. But uh, yeah, so these are, those were just sort of my uh, behind the scenes slides I wanted to show. But when the when it comes to the color too, real quick, I, want, we, I got very involved with the design and I want to thank the design team um, for seconds. So that's Molly um, and Kirk and Robin, who is my editor because we got to do a hidden cover. I really wanted to do a separate, like a similar cover, but with a different design. Here we go. And that is, she's got 3D glasses and popcorn instead of a cake. And then I also want to show the back real quick because I wanted to show her relaxing in her office because she is the manager and that's like her after a night, a successful night of a screen. <laughs> but. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to show all that uh, in regards to the design and uh, color question because I thought it was pretty fun to see. So I can uh, unshare it now. That's but, great. Thank you. Yeah. It's good to see all those. Yeah, collaboration is a whole other, whole other kettle of fish, as they say. Um, <laughs> there's another question here. I, it says it's kind of a question for everyone. I think it, I think it started with the course, and so maybe we should start there. Um, the question is, there's a sense of escapism in Decor's work. Can you all, um, starting with Decor, can you speak to how comics are a place that, that offers escapism for people, especially from the digital world? Um, that's a big question. <laughs> okay, so let's try and let's try and do it. Um, Señor Decor, eh, una, una pregunta en... Eh, ¿Cómo piensa usted que es la relación entre los cómics y, y un escape de la realidad, especialmente un escape de, del mundo digital? Bueno, eh, es, una, es una gran pregunta. Eh, últimamente, por lo menos en mi país, prender la televisión y prender la computadora para ver las noticias es bastante angustiante. Entonces, una manera de... de de conectar un poco con, 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 con uno mismo, ¿no? Eh, por, eso está, por eso hice más que nada esta novela en la que él 
trata como, como de escapar de él mismo, de, de, de esa adicción que tiene la, hacia la tecnología. Pero es una pregunta que me deja pensando, porque me lleva, me lleva a mí mismo también, cuando, cuando tuve una, una especie de depresión y me costaba salir y empatizar con la gente, y el dibujo me, me lo facilitó. Eh, en fin, es, es una pregunta bastante compleja, muy interesante. Eh, siento de verdad lo que dice. Um, ok, so, uh, we said was uh, especially like for him in Argentina, uh, and I'm sure for everyone, everywhere, uh, you know, turning on the TV or looking at the news was uh, sort of uh, very stressful and very anxiety inducing. So comics sort of became a, an escape as an activity from these uh, stresses. And it was strange because by doing comics, Uh, and sort of running away, he ended up having a better connection with himself. So it's sort of running away, but also finding yourself at the same time is this strange uh, double process. Um, so yeah, basically. Well, that's great. Um, does anyone else have thoughts about that? Escapism in comics or maybe finding oneself in comics? Abby or John? Um, sure. Um, so I was thinking uh, something similar to what Decor was uh, addressing was that for me, it's like it's not necessarily exactly escape, uh, but, you know, <clears throat> it's, um, you know, like when you travel and, and you come back with all these different stories and they help you understand where you are a little bit better, you know, and, and I think that uh, comics have this really uh, inherently surreal nature to them that I think is really wonderful. Every aspect of a comic can be a story as I mean, everyone on the panel uses every aspect of what they do to tell the stories, you know, and I think that does create like a, a really wonderful mythopoetic, like a really beautiful story world. And like a lot of times when you create these stories, they give us a mechanism by which to understand the world a little bit better. So, so it's like, I don't necessarily want to escape. I want to try to make sense of where I am. And I think stories give us a, um, a really, really wonderful uh, technology for us to, to do that. And I think comics are just so, just ridiculously brilliant. <laughs> you know, just like, I, just, I just love them so much as far as like just how they function. And, you know, you can just dream and, and anybody can make them. And, and I'm just like, I just love engaging with them. So yeah, it's about understanding where I am, I think, with, with the storytelling, you know, it's myth-making. I like the idea of um, traveling and coming mm -hmm. back with stories, because that does seem like what comics do. Abby, do you have any thoughts yeah. about this? Uh, well, it's interesting when you say traveling, because I've drawn some travel books, and I think uh, drawing comics is a really good way to share your experience of traveling. And as re in regard to like this particular book, because it was a completely different journey because I was collaborating, and it ended up that reality mirrored my comic, because the comic, which might sound really funny because it's about a pink, I mean, a purple cat who <laughs> runs the theater, but it, in the comic, it's about, the theme is about sharing something that you made with your friends for, the, for your community's enjoyment. And uh, as we were creating the comic, like, I really felt that's what we did because we were friends and we made this thing together and we're working on it and building it together for the enjoyment of our community and the public. And I, I hope, it just was interesting that even something as fantastical as the story we did could reflect our reality in a way. <laughs> I thought it was fun. Oh, I think you've done mute. I am, yes. I, I, it, it folds back on itself. Somehow the, the, the fantasy gets you back to the ground. Um, we're running a little late. I don't know, do I have time for one more round? Anybody, Miles? I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump in, we'll ask one more. Yeah, you got time for one more, yeah. All right, great, thank you. Um, there, there are questions, there's a number of questions about kind of um, an architectural approach to comics. I think it, this started from, from Abby, but I think it kind of uh, works for all of you. Can you talk a little bit, I don't know, this may be a longer question, but can you talk a little bit about kind of building a world and laying out your world through comics? Abby, we'll start with you, because. Yeah, so uh, when I was working on pitching the comic with Iromaru, I wanted this to have a lot of uh, x-ray uh, views of buildings, like in the Richard Scarry comics, 
those or not cla comics, those classic children's mm -hmm. books. I specifically showed her that kind of cutaway art uh, that shows the inside of the buildings because I really wanted to have a view of like the cool rooms inside of Stormy Mountains, man, you know, the mansion on Stormy Mountain. Because when you're a kid, I think especially like I really remember drawing fantasy homes with my friends and be like, this is the room is going to be filled with pillows so we could do a pillow fight. And this one's going to be filled with a pool so we can go swimming. And this one's going to have only candy in it. And I feel like as an adult, you might lose some of those fantasies of your dream house as a kid. And I, I was trying to tap into that. And uh, I think Udomaro really was able to flesh it out amazingly. Cool. Anybody else have thoughts about that? Oh, yeah. Kind of a big uh, question. Really quickly, as far as like, you know, architecture of the world or like, you know, the way that the, that the page becomes the index for that world. Um, so the original story, you know, on the road by Nettie is, um, is really about like being caught between two worlds, you know, it's that because she's, she's Ni Niger American, like she's Nigerian and American. So is the character. Uh, and so in some ways I thought she was using this story to kind of figure out the tensions of what it means to be from the continent of Africa, West Africa, but also growing up in, in the suburbs of Chicago. And so what we wanted to do with the story is to actually have like these two worlds that are really adjacent to each other, kind of vibrating next to each other. And so we set up the panels a little bit more chaotic to kind of make the um, make make the, the reality a little bit more jumbled and tense. And then using the gutter space as kind of like a meta panel to kind of like show how, you know, it would that this other world was encroaching, like the spirit world, like the, as they call it, the bush was, was encroaching. And so if you look at like the panel structure later, after the tension is resolved, it becomes a lot more uh, normalized, a lot more static and a lot more like, like you know, as quote unquote normal comics, right? Because what's happened is the, um, the tension or the conflict has been resolved. And so we wanted to really try to use the architecture of the page to talk about um, those really, really personal issues that present themselves first as, as horror, you know, but then also at the end of it, it's a resolution. It's about like dealing with these particular past issues and, you know, and then, you know, she's able to, to move forward, you know, so that's, so we wanted to kind of like talk about that with the architecture of the page. That's great. That's great. Um, Lorena, I know this has been a long conversation, but can you maybe ask Decor about um, the yeah. way he, he, he maybe juxtaposes the real world with the fantasy world? Yeah. Um, señor de Corona pregunta más, eh, ¿podría elaborar un poquito más eh, sobre la forma en que el mundo real y el mundo de fantasía eh, están mezclados dentro de sus cómics y en la forma que crea la imagen? Bien, eh, también es una excelente pregunta y me encanta, porque la novela gráfica nació de, de una pesadilla. Yo me despierto en mi cama y escucho llorar a un, a un niño en, una, en la habitación de al lado de mi casa y no me podía mover y sentía ese nene llorar y no podía hacer nada entonces lo que hice fue dibujar esa secuencia pero dar la vuelta no contar exactamente esa pesadilla digamos sino que hacerlo un poco más amable y narrar solamente que un personaje va contando sus sueños y los va anotando en una libretita y termina con un final feliz una Siempre lo que tuve adentro es, es tratar de darle vuelta a todo lo malo y convertirlo en algo más, más amoroso y más positivo. Right. So as he was creating this, uh, it actually started from, um, from a strange sort of nightmare uh, and of hearing like a child crying outside his house and like not being able to do anything about it. So as he created uh, the images and as he uh, sort of put surreal elements into his... Um, his artwork, uh, it was very much about taking um, taking these sort of negative, sort of surreal dreamscapes and turning them into a much more, um, a much gentler sort of version of themselves. Después, por ejemplo, en la novela que mostré anteriormente, pueden ver que hay una, una casa que es estre extremadamente fina, muy fina, y eso tiene que ver con un sueño que tuve que no sé por qué soñé con la Casa Blanca de los Estados Unidos, y todas las personas eran chatas y iban de costado así como cangrejo pasando de habitación en habitación. Y recuerdo comentárselo a Claudia, la editora de Enchanted Lion, y nos moríamos de risa, y en fin, eso terminó 
lo terminé dibujando, pero precisamente porque por la conexión que, que, que logro hacer con los sueños y la, y la realidad, que me encanta, de hecho, me encanta jugar con eso. Yeah, and so uh, another sort of weird dream connection that made it onto the book is there's a very, very narrow house uh, in the graphic novel that was actually a version of um, like a strange, uh, a strange version of the White House that the court dreamed about that was very, very narrow. And so it was so narrow that everybody was very broad and flat and had to walk sideways throughout the whole space. So that was also part of it. And like, you know, they, it was something that like the editors liked and stayed in the book. So there's like a weird subconscious connection to all of it. Y una cosa más que me gustaría decir es que suelo tener, no sé si se alcanza a ver algunos, algunos dibujos de los artistas que más me gustan rodeándome, pero particularmente cuando inició la novela había hecho este trabajo que lo pegué con chinches al, al costado de mi, de mi escritorio y este personaje, que se, no sé si se alcanza a ver chiquitito acá con el perro, eh, yo se, tenía la sensación que ese personaje me estaba mirando todo el tiempo y que algo me quería decir. Entonces a la, a la hora de... de empecé, a, empecé a contar la novela gráfica usando una nena, como vieron en los primeros bocetos. Hice aproximadamente unas 10 páginas cuando tuve esta comunicación con este personaje que me miraba desde la pared y decidí ponerlo en la novela que se llame Lorenzo. Pero fue una comunicación extraña, muy extraña, de tener un personaje en la pared que sentís que te está mirando y que te quiere decir algo. Entonces, mezclar esa, esa fantasía, esa, esa irrealidad, entre comillas, eh, también se me mezcla ¿no? con la forma de, de, de contar los sueños, estas cosas, la realidad, las cosas buenas, las cosas malas, todo, todo se mezcla. Right. Uh... So it's sort of everything mixed together for him uh, when, he, when it comes to building images and building comics. And uh, the, images, the image he showed there was part of uh, what he keeps around his desk all the time, just uh, things that are inspiring by other artists or things he does. And that little boy in the top right corner sort of, uh, sort of looked out to him a lot and he found himself really fixated on it. And so even though he started this graphic novel with an entirely different main character, a girl, uh, he switched about like 10 pages in and redid the whole thing just because this character was like very, very present to him. So, so yeah, so for him, it's sort of like creating is like a mix between, you know, all these different images and like his awake life and his dreaming life and the like things he sees out of the corner of his eye and all, everything just sort of comes together in like this very uh, fluid way. Es que tampoco hay mucho para crear en este pueblo, hay que recurrir a los sueños. <laughs> he says that there isn't much going on where he lives, so he has to, like, <laughs> you know, he has to use everything he can. Of course, I, I can, I understand. I think we're all feeling that way right now. Um, <laughs> Nos sentimos thank igual. <laughs> thank you so much, everybody. I, I'm afraid we're going to run out of time. I don't want to bump into the next panel, but let me just thank again our guests, Decor, Abby Denson, John Jennings. Thank you, Lorena, for translating. Um, I believe the uh, exhibitions will be up for the weekend. If you want to buy any of these fine artist books, please go to the exhibition uh, uh, room at TCAF. All the notes are in the chat. Uh, thanks again to TCAF. I'm hoping we can all be there in person next year. Uh, it's great to see you all. And thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Robert. <laughs> I agree. I'm hoping next year uh, we'll be able to host a in real life carousel um, and uh, welcome everyone back to the show. Uh, Robert is correct. Uh, we just announced today a one day extension. So uh, of the marketplace, it will close on Sunday uh, now. So uh, make sure to visit torontocomics.com and you'll be forwarded right there. Uh, we have one more panel tonight coming up right after this, starting at eight o'clock. It's called Life into Comedy. Uh, featuring a great uh, lineup of creators. Uh, it should be hopefully a little funny. We'll find out. Uh, and tomorrow is our last day of live programming. We have three programs just like this. Uh, Kids Like Me, Harm Reduction in Comics, and No Holds Bar. Uh, and before I go, a quick thank you to our programming sponsor, Seneca College School of Creative Arts and, Creative Arts and Animation, uh, The Beguiling Books and Art, uh, Page and Panel at TCAF Shop, as well as our government funders, Canada Council for the Arts, 
uh, the Ontario Art Council and the Toronto Art Council. Uh, thanks to everyone for being here tonight. Thank you for attending and get on over to uh, Life into Comedy. Bye everybody. Thanks everybody. Thanks Good for night. watching. Bye -bye.